All right. Hello. Uh, our session is called Design for Circularity, the Future of Sustainable Storage. I'm John Michael Hans from Chia Network. Uh, I'm also secretary and treasurer of a 501c6 nonprofit called Circular Drive Initiative, where we focus on sustainability of storage and reuse. Here with me, I have Louis. Uh, Louis Katsakis, uh, Microsoft. I work in the cloud supply chain operations team. So we're going to do a little two-part. Uh, I'm going to talk through uh, circularity, kind of what OCP sustainability is doing around circularity and what we've done in the, the last two years uh, through the, uh, the various white papers, I'll give some examples of the design for circularity guide and how storage can be more sustainable. So uh, we, we did just re recently release a white paper this year that kind of dictates uh, talks about what sustainability actually means in the ICT industry. Um, unfortunately, even at conferences like this, I see a lot of folks getting things like efficiency and sustainability mixed up. You know, efficiency is one core aspect and one very important part of sustainability, but it is not a sustainability, the only sustainability strategy. So we, we broke the white paper into kind of three main sections, transparency, reporting, and metrics for data center operators, and then for device vendors and manufacturers product circularity, and then efficiency and interoperability. So in the, uh, we actually have a design for circularity guide that, uh, that the OCP published, and this is intended for product managers and people that are designing any kind of product uh, to, to see what they can do to make their products more circular. And this is not like a, a checklist that you need to go in. Uh, it is really just ideas for how folks can, and, uh, you know, product categories that folks can actually implement in their products to make their products more circular. So one of those things is product use, which I think people understand, energy use, uh, disassembly guides, platform resilience. Uh, this is kind of things like how do you uh, reduce failure rates in the field? How do you have reliable devices to keep use phase longer? Materials, I do think... A lot of people think about circularity only in materials and recycling. It is, of course, very important to understand what materials are going into the products uh, and how they get recycled at the end of use. Uh, of course, there's some packaging, but the most important thing uh, and aspect for a circularity is actually reuse and extension of life. So we don't you like to use the word life because you know, devices aren't alive. Uh, we, we like to use the word use. Uh, it's more mindful, but use phase, extending the use phase, is actually one of the top strategies you can use uh, for product circularity. If you take, we just talked a lot about embodied carbon and how impactful embodied carbon is for the life cycle assessments. Uh, in SSDs, specifically, um, you know, the, although these hyperscalers are at 100% renewable energy and that's all great for the data centers, these NAND fabs and memory fabs are not on 100% <laughs> renewable energy. I'll tell you, the number is, is not very high. And it's, um, the embodied carbon of SSDs is, is extremely high um, just because of the, all the energy and manufacturing that goes into manufacturing the NAND dyes and wafers. So if you extend the use period, your per year embodied carbon goes down proportionally. So it is one of the largest drivers of reducing embodied carbon per year. Um, same goes with reuse. So, um, Again, when people think about circularity in um, the ICT industry, a lot of the, they just go right to recycling and disposal, and that's actually on the very, very bottom of the list. And so you, you think about this as a list of priorities of how you would architect a strategy around your product. So first, first and foremost, how do you get the most use out of the device? Second, how do you reuse the device? So now you have to go into strategies like refurbishment, remanufacturing, repairing. Uh, I'm going to give some examples from some SSDs. So, uh, I mentioned, you know, what this. We always get this question about like when is the right time to upgrade, or why, or why do data center operators decide to upgrade? And you know, they make this decision based off of their total cost of ownership. Maybe there is a planned upgrade cycle, um, and but that doesn't mean that the total cost of ownership for those SSDs or hard drives that they're decommissioning doesn't make sense in a smaller data center, a regional data center, or for another customer. Um, so right now, most storage devices are just uh, have a five-year warranty. And there, there's no like magical number. The drives don't just magically turn in, <laughs> turn into dust at five years. Uh, that's just what the warranty is based off of uh, for an annual failure rate. So, in the OCP spec, there's a lot of work to see if we can get SSDs specifically because it's very very easy to monitor the endurance and uh, expected useful period left on an SSD. In looking at five, going from five years to seven years or even longer for the deployments, uh, this uh, firmware and platform resiliency is just. Don't brick the drive. <laughs> don't, brick, don't brick the platform. Um, I think, uh, again, people get HDDs and SSDs 
uh, confused quite a bit, uh, SSDs, the actual number one failure rate of an SSD is caused by firmware failures. So things like uh, in the OCP spec, we have things like firmware update without resets. So you can do field upgrades without any downtime. Um, uh, this is extremely important as you know, I, was a, I worked at Intel for 10 years doing NVMe SSDs and over the life cycle of our, our drives, you know, every single maintenance release firmware that we published had a reliability impact and it got better and better as years progressed. You know, some of the larger product lines ended up getting to like 0.1%, 0.15% AFR over like millions of units. So it can be done, you can make these things extremely reliable, but they need firmware upgrades and they need to be this idea of platform resilience. Um, the other thing is that now the OCP has defined this error recovery log page that if a drive does have a firmware failure and the hardware is still perfectly good, now you don't want to throw that device out but just because the firmware is, is broken. You can actually, the drive now can report to, uh, to the host, hey, this is my fault error state. Here's what you can do to reset me, erase the data, and keep going on. So um, actually, my absolute, absolute favorite thing in the entire OCP NVMe SSD spec is the C0 log page. Um, I posted about this on LinkedIn and did, did not expect like 200 likes. <laughs> so uh, telemetry and health monitoring is like, I guess a really popular topic. And uh, uh, especially for SSDs, because I, I think people um, just don't know that all this robust health and telemetry information is available right there in the log. But this log page is, goes way beyond the normal smart log page. It has lots of detailed information about the NAND stats and PCIe error recovery. There is a ton of useful information about this to be able to predict the uh, useful life left on, on a drive. So um, they are already, uh, we, I talked to the Samsung guys at the booth yesterday, they said, oh, they, they already have a predictive AI model to be able to do machine learning and AI uh, of understanding when these devices are gonna fail based off this, these types of smart attributes. So no, knowing these, logging these, and again, I'm gonna call for OCP to actually start implementing you know, open source tools to be able to re you know, record this over time and basically have this kind of information in a dashboard because then you can easily understand you know, the health of a, of a SSD fleet. Um, of course, uh, and, uh, Zane uh, in the Intel keynote had a really good uh, bullet point, which was this modular approach, this interoperability can reduce embodied carbon by 30%. Uh, as I showed you in you know, the, the what is circularity slide, I believe this is coming from extending the use phase. That would be, uh, I didn't read the, uh, the footnote on the Intel keynote yet uh, about how they calculated that, but I, I suspect it is something like that. So having industry standard form factors is one of the easiest ways to promote reuse because if you are having a drive that you can easily hot swap and uh, disassemble from the server, if it's an industry standard form factor, then you can go reuse that in another server design. Um, I was uh, one of the original uh, designers and product managers for EDSFF, which is a family of form factors for SSDs, and we've expanded that to have a common connector for things like OCP, NIC. Um, now CXL modules are now using the same interconnect. It can run PCIe Gen 5 and Gen 6. So EDSFF, OCP did a lot, quite a bit of work in the storage work group to decide uh, you know, kind of the optimal EDSFF products and make them interoperable between a, a bunch of OCP designs. So again, very important for the circular economy that you know, if you're designing a product for circularity, which again, this, uh, there's two major, major examples of this in OCP with uh, the modular servers and EDSFF, these are very important uh, you know, to be able to actually reuse these. So one of the major blockers of circular economy uh, for data storage, of course, is data privacy and data security. So I'm gonna do a little show of hands. Uh, what, what do you think is more secure, shredding a hard drive or doing a cryptographic erase? Who thinks shredding? You guys are, you guys are too clever here? Okay, so uh, I, got, I got interviewed for, uh, by the BBC for the nonprofit that we do. And uh, you know, I, I had said something along the lines of like, um, basically the, the hard drives have gotten so dense, you know, 500,000 tracks per square inch, that actually even small shreds of drives can actually contain user data. And people can, they've actually demonstrated this at a lab in Southern California where they've took, taken these small uh, bits of drive and actually be able to put them through uh, x-ray and, and microscopes and actually read ones and zeros off them. So <laughs> I, I said this quote, this was uh, the, the top the top ranked uh, comment on Hacker News and somebody says, I, I call bullshit. <laughs> no way, show me one example of anybody doing this. Uh, so 
Turns out, I actually met the guy who wrote the, the NSA and DOD spec, and, and I talked to him about this, and uh, you know, kind of trying to find out what, what was the origin of, this, of these requirements. Now, most data centers are not the NSA. Most data, one, one of the most important things about data is classifying the data properly, because not all data is the most sensitive data. There is low value data, there's medium business value data, and there's high business value data. So one of the most important things you can do in, before you even start about understanding data is you know, in, things like encryption for all data in flight and data at rest. But, um, so something pretty interesting, I, I'm one of the authors of the IEEE 2883 specification for media sanitization, and in this specification, we've actually deprecated shredding as an official uh, perch, uh, as, as deprecated shredding as a, as a destruct method. So there are um, three media sanitization methods defined in the spec. Clear is just easy wiping the data, preventing from non-invasive data recovery. Destruct, I mentioned, now you have to go to incinerate or disintegration to basically have assurance that all the data is gone. Or our favorite, which is purge. It's using logical or physical techniques to render the data inaccessible by even state-of-the-art equipment, like laboratory equipment, uh, people that have backdoor access to firmware, uh, people that have, look, can look at reallocated sectors and bad blocks and over-provision space. So a, a purge does all these things. And there's three techniques to do a purge. One is an overwrite, which is what hard drives are usually implement. Uh, Ari gave a, gave a nice presentation in the OCP security track, and I urge you to watch that. Uh, about how some of this stuff works. And, but overwrite is basically overwriting uh, the drive with a pattern. The good thing about overwrite is it makes it very easy to verify. You can read that data back. And so we've talked to some customers about, okay, well, if you use this overwrite and then you do a verification, which is reading all that data back and making sure that you are proving that there is no more data on that drive, well, you can't read the bad box because they're bad and you can't read them. <laughs> uh, and you, you also can't read the over-provision space from the host access. So the only, that's where crypto erase comes into play. If you change the media encryption key, any data that was user data was tied to that old media encryption key. And now it is uh, uh, scrambled and unable to be decrypted. So crypto erase is extremely, extremely powerful. But there are caveats. You have to know that the vendor actually implemented the uh, media encryption key capabilities and the key wrapping, the key management, has to have a certain AES strength. And boy, you can't just look at a drive and say, okay, does this actually meet it? <laughs> you actually have to ask, ask the drive vendor. Um, so uh, we're actually doing okay on time. I'm gonna <laughs> rip through these last two slides. So, okay, what, what, what happens today? So I just told you there's, there's actually um, a purge technique uh, which is this block erase, crypto erase, or uh, overwrite, you can actually check the log. In, NVMe has a very nice sanitized log that will tell you the progress of the command, if it was run, the last time it was run, if it was successful, if it failed. Um, you can actually do this host verification, which is reading back all the data. Okay, why do we do this? You, you have to prove that the data is gone so that we can get the liability off the, the person doing the media sanitization. We have to do this so that we can try to do the transfer of ownership of the device and give the, life, the drive a second use. So this certificate of sanitization is that legal framework to actually transfer the liability and the policy from the operator who is performing the media sanitization now to, uh, you know, away, because they've proven that they've actually used a, a proper purge method, that it was, it was they're, they're, they're um, documenting the tools and such that they use. So what we are talking about now is how do we get to a hyperscale level of, of reuse in media sanitization? And there was two major things that announced at OCP this year, OCP Safe, which will be this this actual firmware audit, where now there will be an OCP way to actually go in and do a third-party audit of the firmware and make sure all that stuff I just mentioned about key wrapping, key management, sanitization, bad blocks, over-provisioning, that everything happens correctly. And OCP Safe is going to be a major, major key uh, way to go enable the trust that these vendors are actually doing this correctly. Um, of course, the vendors also validate their own sanitize, but most of them don't do a good job of actually even reporting that. A lot of them still call it secure race or, uh, you know, so again, just getting very specific on the terminology because it's very important. And uh, the other major thing that's going on in the OCP security work group is uh, looking at attestation. So how do you do the firmware measurement? So now that you've verified that this purge method can be done on a drive and this drive model and firmware does it correctly, how do you now cryptographically authenticate that that is the right firmware and the drive is running that? So. I am out of time, but again, 
Why do we want to do this? We want to reduce embodied carbon. This is a slide from my friend Marshall at Micron, who's the director of sustainability. He presented this at Flash Memory Summit, but showing that extending the use period by 70% can actually reduce the greenhouse gas impact um, for a life cycle assessment of a drive by up to 40%. Now, there's another approach you can do. You can actually just give the embodied carbon to the first use and then have a refurbished drive, which has no uh, embodied carbon. So th there's a couple ways to do this, but uh, it hasn't been done at scale. Life, uh, life cycle assessments need to be performed. A lot more research needs to happen. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Louis to talk about Microsoft's per perspective. All right. Thank you, John Michael. Uh, thank you, everybody. So I'm going to go through a few slides here, and I'm going to build off of what John Michael shared and then drill down to what Microsoft does in terms of sustainability, what our landscape looks like in the cloud and the HDD SSD um, landscape, and then what we're doing to address that. Okay. So here you see uh, four pillars of our Microsoft's commitment to sustainability. These are public-facing statements that came from executive leadership and what we're doing in each one of these pillars. The second pillar that I have outlined in the green box, waste, that's a space that the team I work on and what I do, I can directly influence and help drive toward uh, zero waste. Okay. So next slides here, what I want to showcase, a takeaway here is that we have a large cloud landscape. Okay, we have data centers all over the world, many countries. Uh, we have uh, millions and millions of a server install base, which means we have you know, four to eight X of that millions in HDDs and SSDs that we currently 100% shred all. Okay? Again, I have two green boxes around pillars that the team I work on, I can directly influence and drive action associated with it. Uh, the circular centers, in case anybody's wondering, that was us over the past few years vertically integrating operations to where we can control channel management and development of components that are getting decommissioned. That allowed us to drive proof of concepts, create new channels, or in this case, focus on what do we do for our HDD, SSD, shred all challenge that we have. Okay, so what does that look like? What you can see here, where I have the graph divided in two sides, is in the past, FY23 and before, what our shred volume was, what the amount of decommissioned HDDs and SSDs were, and what it's growing to. I've sanitized the drive, removed off the numbers, but it's in the millions, and you can see the growth rate that we're having. Now, if we ever delay any decommissions of the drives or get, get them postponed, the drives don't magically disappear. They just carry over into the following fiscal year. So we're trying to be proactive to get in front of this wave, this tidal wave of drives that we're going to be seeing coming through our circular centers or that we're decommissioning. Okay. So what does this bar graph look like? Well, it translates into over 10 million kilograms of shredded material and 27, 25 plus jumbo jets. That's what we'll be shredding equivalently from FY25 to FY28. So what are we doing? What are we doing to try to address this challenge that we have in front of us? Well, the first and most common question that comes up is, why don't we reuse internally? Okay, why don't we decommission drives and see what we can reintroduce as spares within our own ecosystem? Well, we did an analysis and we looked backwards and we said, okay, based upon what we're seeing from a decommission uh, status and what our install base is, against any warranty that we have or any other restrict contractual restrictions we have with suppliers, what is that opportunity? Well, that opportunity is small. It's anywhere from 7 to 10 percent. Again, this is just a basic analysis that we looked at what that opportunity entails. So what does that mean? It means we still have a 90 percent challenge in front of us. We still have 90 percent of those millions of drives that we're shredding all. Okay? So we had to rethink and look at ourselves and say, what else can we do? You know, what, what are opportunities do we have to address that other 90%? Well, fortunately, uh, the company I work for, we have a lot of enablers that allow us to have success. You know, the first one is supplier partnerships. That's upstream and downstream. We have our downstream recyclers or IT asset disposition suppliers and our upstream OEMs that engage with our teams and ask us to help, you know, solve this solution. So that's a great partnership that we have. And then our sourcing organization is very active in driving these conversations with any sustainability partners that they have that they work with. And that's where the operations teams come into play and help drive these solutions. 
Second one I've already mentioned, by having circular centers, it allows us to come up with new ideas. Um, we have the ability to maintain our chain of custody and security because our circular centers are within the secure perimeter of our data centers. So that allows us more flexibility to drive solutions. Uh, third one I have on here is channel development. We're fortunate that we can do pilots and proof of concepts. You know, innovation is you know, you know, highly encouraged in our organization. So we can incubate concepts and learn fast from our failures and then continuously improve. Uh, another uh, two factors that I don't have listed here that enable us to you know, be successful is we have supportive leadership. You know, our management drives and wants this, and then we have budget. Our finance partners help allow us fund these kind of activities. Okay? So I've talked about the internal reuse, and then you know, I've shared here what are some enablers for success. So what are we pursuing now? We're pursuing two recycling channels that are both gonna get funneled through our circular centers, and we're looking at direct recycling. Uh, what, what that allows us to do is, by, uh, I have depicted here in the top part of the slide on the right-hand side, is we will disassemble the drives. We're looking at disassembling the drives, whether it's robotic, manual, vibration, chemical uh, disassembly. We're looking at all these various options that we have to break down the components and be able to segregate the material either segregate the components or segregate the material and still destroy the platters. Okay, so we're still maintaining our security requirements of shredding all. But we don't have to shred the magnets, you know, where there is the neodymium associated with it where we can, you know, find a secondary market for it. The other channel we're looking to pursue is OEM recycling. This is more along the lines of, you know, circular economy supply chain principles. If we can disassemble the components or have our OEMs partners disassemble the product themselves, and then take those components and return them back to their tier two and tier three suppliers. Now we've added second and you know, third you know, tertiary circular supply chain aspects you know, here. Again, all this is in association with sustainability. Okay? So these are both right now in progress. We have proof of concepts pilots that we're pursuing, and we'll look to try to enable them, and then in the scale future them. You know, in the future scale them, excuse me. And what will that look like? So if we create optimal scenarios with these new channels we're creating, we'll be able to go from the far left where we're shredding all to where we can increase our OEM and direct recycling, which is the darker shade of blue on this chart, and allows us to grow those channels. Uh, the internal reuse I have represented here, it, it'll be a small portion of that percentage. And then the top, the light blue, current state processes we know that we will still have to shred all. As John Michael said earlier, there's classifications of data that if it's high business impact classification, we will still shred all. Or if it's in areas where we do not have a circular center or a viable partner to fulfill the OEM or direct recycling channels, we will still shred all. But this is an just optimal view of what we will want to get to as we optimize and scale the channels I've mentioned, okay? All right, that was my last slide. Okay, John Michael. Thanks, Louis. So, yeah, as, as we just discussed, I mean, the OCP needs a lot of collaboration to solve these problems. I think we're there. We're really, really close. You know, again, to be able to do this at scale, um, we need people to step up and, like Louis said, run pilots, be creative, run experiments, publish this data. It, it, the, the liability about data privacy and leaking like we can get the risk to near zero. And the problem is that you can never say it's gonna be zero, but I can say it's one in a hundred million. And is that enough to stop shredding all the drives? And we, we just have to get to a point there as an industry. Now, we, we did write a whole white paper on data sanitization. Uh, myself, Ari, and some other folks were authors. It's, it was a year and a half ago, and I think it's still very good. The principles still stand. I think we need to really continue the research, continue the focus from OCP. Again, we have a design for circularity guide that, that, that the folks in the OCP Sustainability Project put together. It is very good. There's lots of topics in there that product managers should be looking to the products. I mentioned a lot of SSDs already have lots of good features for circularity. They just don't know it yet. <laughs> so now they can just start talking about it. Um, so with that, uh, thank you guys. Uh, was there any questions? So I understand most data you store is already encrypted before you write it. 
So why do you need to shred the drive? You, yes. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, yeah. I'll, I'll share with you what, what, why we shred internally. We, oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. All right, so the question is why do we shred? We shred because we have internal partners that you know, we have to you know, abide by our security policies. Okay, our security policies right now are shred all. And we also have internal partners of, of our engineering groups that own the assets, and for them, their current state preferences shred the drives and destroy them versus having a public relations issue of, as John Michael said, a, a shard of a platter getting put under a microscope and somebody reading data off of it. Okay? The loss of potential, you know, Microsoft running on trust is greater than us salvaging a couple hundred dollars from reselling a drive or reusing a drive. So those are the constraints we're dealing with. Until we get to a place where our internal teams and, you know, the, the marketplace is comfortable with the drive erasure practices, then we can pursue other channels. Otherwise, I need to follow the paths that I was displaying on the slides of either uh, direct recycle or internal uh, direct recycling, okay, uh, OEM recycling as well. Okay. One question on the recycle economics. Uh, you know, you said you'll ship back to the OEMs after uh, server refresh cycle, right? Like, you know, it's typically for a hyperscale is somewhere around five to seven years where the depreciation is already accounted for it uh, after seven years. Uh, so what will be the cost left for the OEMs to take it and they go sell it, and sell it in, the, in the secondary market? Yeah, so that's where you know, the, my, my commercial partner and sourcing are, are working together to drive these proof of concepts and pilots where we'll balance the and offset any costs associated with proving it out in hopes that we drive efficiencies in the processes. Okay? Um, we will, in, from, the, from our side, we will incur a cost savings. We'll still have a cost with shredding with our internal process of a, whether it's disassembly, but it'll be less than the current cost of shredding it through shredders on site or when we bring an IT asset disposition mobile shredding uh, device to our facilities. Okay? So there's, there's still costs associated with it. Uh, we're looking at you know, potentially break even, but hopefully in the future as these channels scale and grow, and we can unlock more opportunities with the disassembled components, or what that value recovery is, then we'll hopefully see a greater return. Okay. Okay, I think that's it. Okay, thank you, everybody.